So thanks a lot for joining us today and to the seminar on high self-selection of Ukrainian refugees in European host countries. My name is Andreas Edel. I am the Executive Secretary of Population Europe. Population Europe is a network of 36 European uh, research institutes in the field of population studies. And uh, the institute, one of the institutes which is involved today is also one of our founding members. Uh, so I'm really proud also to have you today with us. As we have only one hour uh, for this meeting, and I would like to save as much time as possible uh, for the discussion, uh, let me jump immediately to our eminent speakers today and let me introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Judith Kohlenberger is a research scientist at the Institute for Social Policy at the Vienna University for Economics and Business and one uh, of the leading migration researchers in Europe. The same holds true for Isabella Buba Enza. She is a scientist at the Vienna Institute of Demography, at the same time the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital. Since 2008, she is a deputy research group leader of Demography of Austria at the Vienna Institute of Demography of the Austri Austrian Academy of Sciences and since 1996, research scientist at this institute. Konrad Pechiviatl is an associate researcher at the Center for Migration Research. He's a professor in the Department of International Affairs at the Krakow University of Economics. He's a researcher at the Center for Advanced Studies of Population and Religion and initiator and coordinator of the Multiculturalism and Migration Observatory. So thanks a lot to the three speakers uh, for giving today this webinar, and I would like to hand over then to Judith. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the introduction and also for the uh, possibility to present um, our very first insights um, into the surveys that we conducted um, here for Population Europe. Um, this is a premiere also for us and indeed also for the audience uh, watching and listening today, because this, this is the first time that we, we are presenting results from our study to a wider audience. Um, so basically, the title uh, of our presentation today already takes away our main message, namely that we found very high self-selection among those Ukrainian refugees who made their way to uh, Western European host countries and also uh, to neighboring countries. I would like to start by giving you uh, some context, especially now, six months after the outbreak of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. Uh, it seems that um, we are no longer hearing weekly news about those who are displaced um, and who continue to be uh, displaced from Ukraine. But just to give you a bit of context here, um, as of the 23rd August 2022, uh, we have more than or almost 7 million refugees from Ukraine who are displaced across Europe. And of course, different host countries were um, affected differently. The dimensions in European countries very significantly, one of the countries most affected by the uh, wave of displacement from Ukraine was the neighboring country Poland, um, where currently um, between 1.3 to 2 million Ukrainian refugees are hosted. And in some cities, uh, like for instance, Warsaw or Krakow, uh, where we conducted the survey, um, this has led to uh, indeed a uh, growth of the resident population there. So very high dimensions and a large size of the Ukrainian population in Poland. In Austria, on the other hand, uh, the size of the Ukrainian population is much smaller, also relative to the Austrian population size. But still, currently, we have about 80,000 uh, Ukrainians who are registered there and who are hosted there temporarily. And as we might conjecture, some of them perhaps also permanently. So this is the context in which our surveys were situated and our study's aim was actually, I would say, rather simple because we wanted to see who actually arrived in these two countries and how do these populations, Ukrainian population in Poland and Ukrainian population in Austria differ, differ with regards to their socioeconomic background, also with regards to the resources they bring to the countries, the needs that they have, and their intentions for the future. Do they plan to stay in the host country for a certain period of time? 
or do they intend to go back um, perhaps even before the war has ended? So these, we think, are key questions for, on the one hand, the academic community, but also very much so uh, for political decision makers and for policy. When we go to the next slide, please. Um, so the question that we ask ourselves was, who are the arriving populations? As you can see here, this has been at the top of many uh, headlines across international media, especially uh, immediately after the outbreak of the war. And been, by now, there have been some uh, surveys con being conducted uh, across Europe, indeed. For instance, early insights from uh, studies conducted by UNHCR, both quantitative and qualitative surveys, uh, but also in the beginning, in the first few weeks um, after February 24th, we had online surveys uh, that are, of course, much easier to do in the sense that you can uh, start the field work sooner than when you do face-to-face -face interviews. And these first surveys really indicated already that there might be a high self-selection um, going on when it comes to Ukrainian refugees in Europe. So those Ukrainians uh, who moved to European host countries and especially further on to Western European host countries might be self-selected in terms of educational background, economic background and so on. Um, interestingly enough, we already saw similar um, results when looking at the refugee population from Syria and Afghanistan in 2015. Um, I remember vividly that we, uh, back in 2016, also presented a first insights from a study we did then, right here at the Population Europe. And it, it also showed that those Syrians that moved uh, to European host countries typically were of a higher social class and had higher educational attainment than those refugees who stayed in the region or even were only able to move within the constraints of the nation state, so within uh, Syria, having to do with the fact that, of course, uh, forced migration over long distances also requires a lot of resources. So this high self-selection of more educated and uh, people of a higher social class has already been well documented uh, in literature. So now coming to our surveys that we conducted, um, mostly focusing on early arrivals from Ukraine in the two countries, Austria and Poland. The data collection took place between April and June this year in the cities of Vienna and Krakow, both cities most heavily affected really by the Ukrainian inflow. In Vienna, the survey was conducted at the central and the official arrival center in the city of Vienna, where almost all Ukrainians who moved to Austria, especially to the east of Austria, had to pass through, which was, of course, convenient in terms of sampling and collecting data. Um, and in Krakow, the data collection took place at several locations in the city where Ukrainian refugees had to register and also assemble to receive help and support. Um, the surveys were conducted as multi-mode, so on the one hand we distributed paper and pencil questionnaires uh, available in three language versions in Ukrainian, Russian and English, and surprisingly really most respondents decided to participate in the Ukrainian language and not in Russian or English. Um, for the Austrian survey, we also had the option of participating online, but not distributed widely over the internet but really only via personalized individual QR code that was distributed on site and people had the option of scanning the QR code on their phones and then uh, taking the survey online. But the QR code could not be passed along. So it was one person, uh, one survey, um, which helped to prevent unintentional snowballing. An interesting side uh, result of this was that surprisingly to us, uh, almost all participants decided to do the paper and pencil questionnaire and the online version was not very popular at all so that was also surprising a bit. The sample sizes as you can see here in Vienna we managed to um, have a more than 1,000 respondents so a very big sample really compared to the um, relatively small um, size of the Ukrainian refugee population in Austria, um, which of course has to do with this, with the fact that there was a very um, 
easy to survey location with the registration center. In Krakow, we have a sample size of 500 respondents. And I think this is something that has already become uh, very well known uh, also in the wider public. The majority of refugees moving to European host countries was female. And so this was also the case in the Viennese and in the Krakow sample. Some impressions from the field phase. On the left hand side, you see pictures from the Viennese registration center. Um, back in, I think pictures were taken in April, right at the beginning of the field phase. Um, and on the right hand side, from uh, Poland in Krakow, in both locations, um, it was rather valuable from a scientific point of view that people sometimes had to wait um, a longer time for their appointments there. And so they used the waiting time. You can see the waiting areas pictured here to fill in our survey. So this was actually from um, our point of view, from a survey point of view, something that helped to increase um, respondents and it also helped to increase completion rate. We had very high completion rates uh, with the survey. Moving on to our first results now concerning the origin of respondents, where did most of the Ukrainian refugees come from? Here already we have first uh, differences between the two samples. On the left hand side, you see the origin of respondents in the Venice sample and very clearly pictured because this is the only spot in dark purple is Kiev. So, uh, relative to the overall sample, we see a high proportion of respondents coming from Kiev, directly from Kiev, so it's an urban population very much. On the other hand, in the Krakow sample, especially when you look at the smaller images of the uh, Ukrainian map down below, you can see that the eastern regions are overrepresented. So in Krakow, compared to Vienna, the uh, refugee population is more rural and uh, more uh, comes from um, the eastern regions of Ukraine, which were, of course, also heavily affected uh, by the war there. So this is already a first difference in sampling concerning the uh, regional origin of respondents. This already brings me to a second major insight, namely the socioeconomic background of respondents. And I think this ties in nightly with the difference between urban and rural population. Um, on the one hand, uh, we used uh, the item of home ownership to as an indicator for the socioeconomic background of Ukrainian refugees. Um, so the question that respondents were asked was their living situation before Ukraine, whether they owned or rented the house or the apartment they lived in. Um, and here you can see a comparison between the Krakow sample in blue and the Viennese sample in yellow. Now, not surprisingly, in both samples, um, ownership of the apartment was rather widespread. And actually, it is more widespread in Ukraine than, for instance, in Austria, Poland, to own the apartment that you live in. Um, however, uh, a certain difference can be seen between the percentages of rented apartment and a uh, whole house ownership and I think this uh, ties in nicely with the difference between the urban and the rural population that in the Viennese sample because more people came from an urban context more people also rented an apartment in this sample whereas house ownership which is also classically associated uh, more with the rural areas was more common in the Krakow sample. In the Viennese survey, additionally, we used another indicator for socioeconomic background, which was uh, social class by self-assessment. So respondents were asked how they would assess their own social class on a scale from one to 10. And now it's interesting to see that, that um, most respondents, um, the majority, really half of them uh, considered themselves upper middle class, uh, 50%. And, and a further uh, 30%, 31% said they were lower middle class. Um, so rather of a higher socioeconomic background and only a very small percentage would self-assess their social class as working class. So this is another indicator um, of the uh, rather high self-selection that we are presented with here uh, by the Ukrainian refugees who moved further to Austria. And now I will hand over to my colleague Isabella, who will present results on the population distribution and educational attainment. So thank you, Judith. Uh, we have to uh, mention and to underline that we collected basic information not only on the respondent, but also on the partner and on the children. And thus we have information on more than 4,000 
uh, persons in our surveys. These age pyramids that you see here, they visualize the refugees living in Vienna and in Krakow, which are captured in our samples. They include respondents on the one hand, as well as their children and eventually partners living in Austria and in Poland, respectively. As expected, the Ukrainian refugees are disproportionately female and in young and middle adulthood or children. And interestingly, the share of women arriving with their partners was much higher in Austria than in Poland. For Austria, we are also able to compare with Ukrainians registered in Vienna, according to the Zentrale Melderegister. And it turns out that the age and gender structure overlap, indicating that uh, we have no substantial bias in the Austrian sample here. Um, education is a main determinant in demography. It is associated with almost all demographic events, like leaving the parental home, age at first, childbirth, mean number of children, well-being, and life expectancy. And so education and human capital was key in our uh, surveys. We find a high selection of refugees in terms of education. In Austria, as you see among women, more than 50% had a master or doctor and further 23% obtained a bachelor degree. Few had educational training and contrary in Poland, the educational distribution was different with more having lower secondary education or no education or, or low education or vocational training. For Austria, numbers allow analysis for men, and we find that the educational structure is similar, and that men are even slightly higher educated than women, with 55% versus 52% with a master or doctor degree. The same holds true for the partners of our female respondents, which um, who, are, who remain in Ukraine. So 55% of them have a master degree, and further, it has to be said that more of them have a vocational training. For host societies and countries, the inflow of highly educated uh, refugees means that a rapid recognition of academic degrees will be key for preventing stark mismatches uh, between qualifications on the one hand and the jobs people are ending up in. Uh, next, we compare the education of the refugees with the general uh, population in Ukraine in 2021. This figure here depicts the share of tertiary educated among those aged 25 to 64 years. In 2021, among the Ukrainian population in this age group, the share of those holding a bachelor degree or higher tertiary education was 30%. And as you see, the shares are higher among women than among men with 33% compared to 28%. Among Soviet Ukrainian refugees, this share amounts to 66% in Krakow and to 83% in Vienna. This figure visualizes that self-selection is more pronounced with increasing distance from the home country. So assuring the high educational attainment, we have to say that we also ask for the language people uh, speak, and it turned out that two-thirds of responding refugees in Austria and one third in Poland reported to speak English. For participation in the labor market, this means that part of the refugees who do not speak the language of the host country, German or Polish, can adequately communicate in English. We then ask why people came to Austria or ended up in Austria, and their high degree of self-selection is also reflected by the refugees' reasons for the choice of the host country. Those who traveled farther than neighboring countries could often rely on personal and professional networks for support. For Ukrainians moving to Austria, networks of friends, acquaintances, and colleagues were more relevant than family abroad. Further reasons for choosing Austria as host country include high quality of life, a well-functioning welfare system, previous days as tourists or students, as well as German language skills. This degree of familiarity is unusual in the context of European host countries, where previous cohorts of refugees from the Middle East or the Global South displays much less knowledge and active choice of the host country. For policymakers and the state agencies, active choice and familiarity can become assets for facilitating the integration into the host society. 
as you see, um, for Ukraine, close to the U Ukraine, it was very important and, and selected by almost four out of uh, 10 refugees interviewed. Finally, the majority of refugees felt welcome when arriving in Poland and Austria, and in Poland even to a larger extent than in Austria, with 82% saying that they totally felt welcome when arriving in Austria. And now I hand over to my colleague, Konrad. Yes, I would like to, um, one of the key issues uh, with um, the reception of um, refugees is uh, the issue of provision of housing. And uh, this is one of the dimensions we were trying to analyze in our survey. And as you can see, uh, in the case of uh, Austria, almost 60% of Ukrainians uh, rent um, most apartments or rooms. And uh, one fifth uh, of uh, respondents uh, were living with an uh, Austrian family. Very importantly, which is not so much visible on this, but uh, you need to know that 6% of uh, uh, refugees in Austria uh, were at the time when we were collecting data, were living in collective or temporary shelters. Um, this information about the, um, uh, especially concerning the rented pop, uh, renting cohort and those living with Austrian family, I think uh, is very important uh, um, to understand the reception system in Austria where the refugees are provided so with financial support to, to rent uh, accommodation. This is not the case uh, of Poland, refugees in Poland are um, not uh, receiving any financial help uh, apart from the help provided by UNHCR to only a limited number of refugees for uh, renting apartments. So um, the, the fact that a significant number of uh, refugees uh, in Poland, Ukrainian refugees in Poland are renting apartments or, um, or uh, houses uh, rather than or rooms is in a way um, an evidence of the fairly high status of these people who are able or at least part of this group to, as you can see it's around um, 39 um, percent of respondents who are um, well enough to to be able to to rent some premises uh, a very important group, as you can see here, um, is relying on the, on the help from the Polish society. Um, the, the fact that uh, only 12% of uh, uh, refugees are living with the Polish family has to do with the structure of the housing market and the fact that Poles rarely own big houses to be able to, to actually house, uh, to, to have someone else. But a significant number, as you can see, 20, 20, over 21% of uh, Ukrainians are living in someone's flat for free. This is possible due to partially, due to uh, a special program of the government called 40 plus uh, that uh, provides uh, uh, funding for the po Polish families who have um, given uh, uh, accommodation plus food to uh, Ukrainian families. The problem with this program is that initially it was uh, um, uh, planned for 60 days, now extended to 120 days, which for most of the uh, Ukrainian refugees has ended. And there are no clear information about the extension of this program. And the big challenge, which is not so much visible in, in this, but, but a very big issue is almost one fifth of the uh, Ukrainian refugees who are staying in uh, collective accommodation or temporary shelters. This uh, persons are in a semi-homelessness situation and their situation is particularly difficult when it comes to the provision of, of housing. And the, this is very much linked with the structural issues of housing market in, problem, in Poland, namely 
a minimal social housing stock uh, up to 200,000 and uh, a very a general shortage of adequate uh, accommodation. Uh, Isabel? Yes. Uh, when it comes to a uh, very important question which is being asked is the question about the return um, of migrants, uh, whether they will return, when they will return. Um, we've asked um, our respondents uh, two questions about it. And as you can see, the question about the return intentions um, is uh, particularly interesting because it shows that there is an an overlap uh, of um, answers. You can see that the, the, the largest number of people say that they want to return as soon as the war ends and that uh, they I may return in case the war uh, ends. This uh, questions both are showing a clear intention of return. At the same time, you can see that uh, we just, the same amount of people say they have nothing to return to. A significant percentage of, especially a Polish sample, comes from the eastern regions, which are now occupied by Russia, and uh, their uh, houses are uh, demolished and they have nothing to return. So you can see this is a significant number. But um, in the case of Krakow, higher number of people are considering return even if the war hasn't ended. And this is what we've been observing over the last uh, two months, a significant number of Ukrainian refugees uh, returning back to, to Ukraine. Uh, one of the reasons is the problem with uh, housing mentioned earlier, but also the, 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 the general system of reception and integration uh, built in Poland. And um, higher number of uh, in this sort of undecided person in, in, in the case of uh, Austria and uh, lower in Poland, I will, I, I, it's interesting to compare that also with Syrian refugees, which I'll do in a second. Um, just one uh, back uh, um, is about to this plan to, to stay in Austria. This is very interesting. Just uh, one sentence on this. You can see that much higher number of Ukrainian refugees are planning to stay in Austria and, and say that they want to stay in Austria uh, rather than in the case of Poland and more sort of undecided persons in the case of Poland. So yeah, just a comparable um, information on the, on the data which we are collecting in the different project response, which showed uh, how Syrians were feeling about the return. Syrians uh, who were um, surveyed in Sweden and Turkey, in a way, obviously taking all the differences of the Syrian conflict into, into account and the fact of the, the war being sort of for the regime change and against the regime change. Uh, uh, you can, in a way, see Turkey as a neighboring country like Poland in the case of Austrian, uh, sorry, Ukrainian crisis, and Sweden as more far away sort of option. And in the, this is the case of, of Austria in, in, in our sort of current uh, research. So here you can see that clearly this is 2020, so much more advanced in time and much, much higher number of people who are saying that they are, they will never, never think of returning to Syria. So you can see that the intentions of return, um, if you put it away from time, is obviously much, um, much uh, lower, and and a higher number of people don't want to return. And here, interestingly, um, uh, these uh, people who. Uh, who, who do not have idea as well, interestingly, is, is higher in, in Sweden uh, than in Turkey. And in a way, a little bit similar um, to, to this, uh, the same questions we asked uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees in Poland and, um, and, and Austria. Uh, so uh, the, what, what we try to look at it also in, the, in, the, in our survey is the different um, forms of help received and some of the uh, key issues um, Ukrainian refugees faced while, um, while, uh, while for example, accessing um, various uh, 
education or, or labor market. And here clearly we see that uh, one of the most important uh, uh, forms of help they particularly appreciated was the, the, the accommodation and the material support, uh, which was provided also information, as you can see, stand high. Uh, and, but also uh, accommodation, uh, labor market and medical care are some of the most sort of problematic areas um, uh, when when it comes to uh, to life uh, in in Poland and and it has to do with the mentioned earlier sort of structural issues of housing market uh, and and housing provision in Poland um, also medical uh, care support. And uh, when it comes to the labor market, which is treated in Poland as a magic wand of integration, um, this uh, is clearly an issue uh, with this, um, with this um, type of uh, refugee crisis we are facing at the moment due to the structural uh, gender sort of dimension of it. Um, women with children who are not able to, um, who need to provide first care to their children and only then may think about, about uh, entering the labor market. It's something new that so far hasn't been tested uh, in the Polish case. And, and this is also one of the biggest challenges. Thank you very much, Conrad. So before we lead into the discussion and try to answer your questions, um, I would like to um, present three main takeaways um, from our surveys. So first of all, um, we found that Ukrainian refugees in Austria and, and this is also key, to a lesser degree in Poland, are a highly self-selected group. Um, they come mostly from a middle class background, especially in Austria, we see a highly urban population to a lesser degree in Poland. But this degree of self-selection that researchers already found for the Syrian and Afghan forced migration um, happening in 2015 and 16, this is even more pronounced when we look at Ukrainian displacement now. And uh, for the first time here, our surveys are providing uh, empirical data to really also support this, uh, which um, many policymakers or humanitarian organizations already showed uh, by giving anecdotal evidence for that. This also leads me to the second and a takeaway, um, and again, um we can see this in the context of other displacement movements, the fact that the further refugees moved from their country of origin, the higher their socioeconomic uh, background turns out to be, which typically also goes hand in hand with the higher educational attainment and the less pronounced also their return intentions. So this means that this degree of self-selection becomes higher um, when we go, um, sorry, Bella, we're not seeing the screen, unfortunately. Maybe you could close that. Um, the less pronounced, uh, that the higher the educational attainment is. So this degree of self-selection um, becomes uh, higher uh, when uh, refugees move further from Ukraine. And it is really coupled to less pronounced return intentions um, when they move further away from the country of origin. So return intentions were actually one of the major reasons why refugees said they only went to Poland, to the neighboring country, um, with the view of being able to return as quickly as possible. But once refugees uh, seem to have decided to move further on to Western Europe, uh, in this case, Austria, it seems that this also went hand in hand with less pronounced return intentions or formulating it differently with more pronounced staying intentions. So the a share of refugees who said they would like to stay in Austria is much higher um, than compared to Poland. Um, what this also shows us on a macro level is that we see differences in the socio-demographic and socio-economic composition of the refugee populations in Austria and in Poland. And this should also lead policymakers to the conclusion that there is not one size fits all when it comes to designing integration measures, but that really host countries need to adapt their integration and support policies 
to the socio-demographic profiles of the populations that they are hosting. Um, and this is where we intended to provide empirical evidence for doing that. Um, Conrad already mentioned some of the areas that need more concern, clearly accommodation, for instance, a key concern in Poland, but also with a view to refugees intending to stay in Austria. Um, this opens up important questions of uh, labor market uh, um, integration, also permanent residence titles beyond temporary protection, uh, and further issues that come into play here. And um, I assume we will also have time to discuss that into more in more detail in the Q&A now. So thank you very much for your attention at this point. I would also like to thank Population Europe, Andreas Edel and his team for giving us the opportunity um, to provide this um, exclusive and first look into our results. Um, and we are very happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judith. It's very much up to us to thank you that you uh, allowed us to, to, to share your insights and your first results. And as I can see from the Q&A section, we have already four questions. So also to the other colleagues in the audience, whenever you have a question, please insert them to the Q&A. And I would like to start right away with uh, the first questions from the floor and my own questions perhaps a bit later. Um, so, Julia Lindorfer put the question, um, could you provide more details on the kind of support that is provided in Austria for renting apartments and who is providing this support? Should I start right away? Okay. Um, so in Austria, the situation is a bit different in Poland, and really it's interesting to see that the data really reflects that, um, as Conrad already said. So in Austria, the main uh, strategy at the beginning when refugees were arriving in late February and early March was to uh, provide private accommodation. So Austrian citizens were asked to um, shelter uh, Ukrainian refugees for a certain period of time. However, this has now reached a six month mark and increasingly, of course, we are seeing what we tend to call a so called refugee fatigue that it's also difficult for the Austrian resident population to continue hosting refugees. So this used to be the first uh, spontaneous strategy by the government uh, focusing on private accommodation, but in Austria, in contrast to Poland, refugees receive direct support, direct financial support. It's not much. Also, uh, when we look at inflation rates and so on, um, but they can actually receive this money directly, which also means that they do have the possibility of at some point renting their own apartment, um, which I think will be difficult in the current situation. Um, here, the question of labor market integration also comes into play, um, but the support is directly provided to the refugees and not only to those people granting private accommodation, which I think is a key difference here. However, despite this rather high socioeconomic background, which of course is only an average, we do see cases uh, of families uh, having made their way to Austria that clearly need more support because they lack financial resources of any kind. And so it's important to keep that in mind as well. And as I said, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be the case that uh, a high share of those who move to Austria are already returning back home. This is might be the case in some minor instances, but overall most are staying. And also let's not forget, it's the start of the school year here in Austria today. And so children of Ukrainian refugees will attend school here. And I think this is also an important factor when it comes to permanent staying intentions. Uh, I would just um, briefly like to add that, um, so th uh, uh, they have uh, full access to um, the medical care system in Austria as uh, all, um, refugees and the um, school and of course access to schools and so forth and uh, yeah yeah so this is yeah thanks a lot for for this uh, good answers to the, to the questions there's another one from brett osler from melbourne um, has your research identified any issues or trends associated with the polish government's 120 day limitation on housing support Increasing interest rates, rentals, increasing inflation, the cessation of the free public transport on 1st of June, reductions in services supporting displaced persons and other related factors. Uh, for instance, these factors seeing displaced persons returning to Ukraine as a result of one or more of these factors rather than a choice. And how do you see this planning out in the coming months or heading to, into winter? And do you see a future turning uh, of the tide uh, with more being displaced from Ukraine. 
I think Conrad, this goes to you. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very important question. Um, generally, um, this uh, refugee crisis, uh, similarly to other refugee crises, is very much linked with the uh, intensity of the um, conflict uh, and the spread of the conflict. So the, the larger is the territory, um, which is part of the, of the military operations, obviously the, the higher is uh, the likelihood that uh, that uh, will have another wave of um, of uh, of uh, refugees. So um, clearly, this is something very much unknown. To what extent the the front lines will stay as they are at the moment, on or they will move. But what we know for sure is that the the um, the the reception and integration mechanisms in place. Uh, are super important uh, in understanding the, the, the scale of um, forced returns, I would say, because we have to be clear, like uh, you write uh, brand saying that in a way it is not so much a choice, it is, it is, more, um, um, it is more a forced uh, um, push uh, that people are um, finding themselves, if they cannot uh, um, find a proper accommodation, if they cannot uh, sustain themselves in a new host country, they search for other options. One option is return. And this option, we can see clearly it is being used, especially when it comes to um, persons uh, who have moved out of um, Kiev and the, the surroundings of Kiev, and a significant number of refugees decided to return back uh, to their houses. And so now the big question is if they will be able to survive uh, winter. It's a little bit of a question to all of us Europeans, how we will survive the winter. Um, it's a winter war for all of us, but uh, particularly so for Ukrainians. So, uh, so possibly those who return may uh, be back in Poland. And also you, you need to understand that a significant number of people also in this uh, questions about the return um, or, or questions about the stay, um, uh, this indecisiveness in these questions is, is a, a lot, I believe in it, is, is, this, uh, is in these issues of, uh, will I be able to find uh, adequate accommodation, to find job, to find a uh, place in school for my children? How will they adapt in this new school environment? And so on and so forth. These questions are, are, are the wide range of many other questions. So, so clearly, um, the, the way how the reception integration system are organized in Poland, in a way, uh, are pushing certain people out of the country uh, to, to pushing them to further to the West, pushing them to, to even closer, not necessarily to Austria, to Czech Republic. If you compare the size of the refugee population in, uh, in Czech Republic, in in, uh, and if you put it uh, with, the, with the size of the population, you may find out that the, the percentage uh, of, of the actually uh, refugee population in Czech Republic is higher than in Poland. And many, not many people talk about it. And one of the reasons for that is the, okay, the diaspora um, uh, that was there before the war, but also the, the reception mechanisms put in place, which are, providing the, the, the refugees sort of a comfortable um, situation to, to think about the future and, and basic comfortable situation for wait to, to, to wait for the for the resolution of, of the situation. So so yeah, uh, I think Brent you're fully right uh, saying that this is um, or suggesting that this is a, a sort of a uh, to large to, to some extent uh, not so much a choice but but a push. Uh, back to Ukraine, but there, there may be 
um, a push uh, push back uh, and and again uh, a forced uh, uh, migration in the coming months yeah, thank you so much uh, i see we have a very lively debate and a lot of uh, questions now so I, let me immediately go to the next one which is again comes from julia leendorfer she asks uh, on types and extents of problems faced in Poland. Do you have any idea why almost half of uh, respondents responded was not applicable? Yes, I think I think it has to do with the with the fact where this question was placed in our questionnaire. <laughs> it was a little bit the end, unfortunately, uh, and and people were uh, basically. Uh, just answering if they had issues, but uh, if they didn't see any issue, they were just keeping it. So this was a little bit uh, of that uh, because uh, uh, they clearly pointed out those areas which we which we see that they are problematic. So in a way, the the survey showed us uh, confirmed some of the some of the findings uh, which we which we know. So that's how I would understand the this these answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next question comes a bit on, on what you already mentioned that there was already a um, uh, Ukrainian diaspora before the war. Um, could you please provide the definition of your research group in both studied cities? It's particularly important in Poland as already before the war, Poland had the big group, a big group of Ukrainian migrants. Well, uh, let, let me start with the, the Austrian case. Uh, well, in Austria, um, it was um, refugees from Ukraine uh, arriving in Austria in, in March and April. So all those who were coming to Austria and to be, uh, had to be registered. And in Vienna, this registration was at one point in the city. And everyone who was coming from Ukraine and intended to stay in Vienna had to go to this place. So this is there. Actually, we, have a, we had a, a rather small diaspora of Ukrainians um, in Austria before, also at the beginning of the year. So there were about 16,500 Ukrainians um, living in Austria, according to the central uh, registration uh, register. And this number uh, raised to 55,000 at the beginning of April. And currently, we roughly have 80,000 uh, uh, persons uh, born in Ukraine or, uh, and living in Austria uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. May I just add the differentiation between the Ukrainian diaspora before the war and the refugees is easy in the legal sense because it was only people under the temporary protection directive, right, that was activated as a sort of special legal status for those Ukrainians leaving the country after February 24th. So that was also the main point of differentiation. And as Isabella said, only those who arrived at the registration center got this special uh, legal status. Yes, this question asked by Professor Gurney um, is very important in the case of Poland uh, because uh, um, it's not so straightforward and easy to differentiate between these uh, two groups uh, um, because of the significant Ukrainian diaspora living in Poland pre-war. So some of the a very interesting exploratory um, report by Polish Statistics in 2020 showed that uh, uh, in spite of what we know from register data, uh, from various types, insurance, uh, um, we know, we, we learned that uh, uh, over 1 million, 1 million 300,000, even higher figures were advanced uh, of Ukrainians living in Poland before the war. Uh, some of these numbers, some of these people, some of the men, uh, from this group decided to go back to Ukraine in the first weeks of the war. Um, there are some estimations of uh, how big was this group, but definitely um, this, uh, this is a very large uh, population. And now um, Union of uh, Polish Metropolis, when they do a big data sort of stock analysis, they are very vague in saying who are refugees and who are not. They are saying about the Ukrainians in, for example, Polish cities, and it's a little bit tricky, especially from their reports to figure out like who, who how big is this population. We've been conducting uh, for several years um, in-depth analysis of register and other type of data in the case of Krakow. So we are able to quite precisely um say how how big is the, the pre-war pre-invasion you need to remember the war started 2014 um uh, pre-invasion sort of uh, 
population and and post invasion and uh, so so we know that uh, but uh, but uh, but it's true in, it's not so easy but in terms of our uh, methodology and the research how we're conducting it was pretty straightforward we were interested in those persons who had uh, who came to to Poland in after the, the the start of the invasion and these people were uh, registering the places in a way where we were collecting data like predefined this population for us so in that way we were able those people who were not entitled to uh, uh, this registration for example UNHCR or PESA registration were, were, were usually not not there so, uh, but obviously we were not checking the passports of our respondents. Uh, so there may be uh, some who have been, uh, who have, uh, who were not uh, uh, refugees per se, but, uh, but were some um, uh, economic migrants for, who for some reason decided in the case of Poland to, to apply for, uh, for example, UNHCR uh, support. Yeah, thank you. We have uh, two questions from uh, two uh, civil society representatives who put the, uh, the focus a bit more on special age groups. Let me perhaps ask them together and then you can answer to them. Um, the first one comes from Jonas Meixner. He's from SOS Kinderdorf. As an organization advocating for children's rights and hosting quite a number of Ukrainian refugee children, are there any findings from your study that point to crucial issues that Austria could target in order to better secure the rights of those children, for instance, access to education, etc.? The other question comes from H Platform Europe, from Paril Apolline, uh, who um, um, asks, uh, did you disaggregate data when analyzing data by age and sex on the forms to, of help received and key problems faced? It, I would be interested to see the representation of older persons, persons over 50 plus, and the overall report, but more specifically, who depicted accommodation, medical care, and access to the labor market as major problems? Who would like to start? I, I will take the policy question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to stress um, um, an aspect that the OECD also suggested very on in the displacement that we uh, see from Ukraine, namely the fact that both with regards to general integration, but specifically also with regards to education and children's rights, um, because we do not know how return intentions, but also return options will look like in the near future, but also in the far future, it's important to adopt so-called dual intent integration measures. So ideally, all the measures and policies that are being taken with a view to Ukrainian children in this case, should prepare them on the one hand for integration in the host country in the educational system, but also in the ideal case, and this is not easy, I understand, for potential return to Ukraine, right? So this is where the stool intent comes from. Now, this is not an easy task, especially when it comes to uh, educational profiles, what should be taught at schools, how do you foster integration into the classroom, but also make sure that uh, Ukrainian children might be able additionally to follow along a, U a Ukrainian curricula, for instance. Uh, difficult questions really, but I think it's key to keep that in mind that we do have a sizable share of the population that wants to go back and perhaps be only able, will only be able to go back in several years time. And I think this is an important message. At the same time also, and now we are, we've reached a six month mark and soon we will reach the one year mark, I'm afraid. So at some point it will be important on the European level, but also national level to talk about permanent residence titles because the current uh, residence title that uh, Ukrainian refugees hold, including children, is a temporary one, right? And so what will happen after the two or maximum three years? And finally, um, as you saw, it's a clearly a uh, highly female population, young women with their children, very often also bringing along the elderly, like the grandparents of those children. So for the women, it means that they have dual um, 
care work to do for their own children, but perhaps also for senior citizens who might need care. So child care, but providing support systems is important because uh, when in Austria, these women are basically on their own because the, the men are back in Ukraine and means that these support structures should be stressed and probably there needs to be more in the months to come. Uh, because what we've learned so far is in the first few weeks and months after the outbreak of the war, uh, uh, most or many Ukrainian men were able to send money to their women who had to flee to support them in the host countries. But of course, funds will run out at some point. Um, and I think this is also important to keep in mind. For the aggregated data, maybe Isabella, you want to take that question? Well, uh, for the aggregated uh, data, well, we are uh, only uh, able to do analysis by, by gender in Austria because in Poland we almost have uh, only female respondents. And also uh, regarding uh, age, it is difficult because then the, the number of persons then get uh, in the cells then get uh, uh, rather uh, uh, low. Um, so, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, and nevertheless, I would like to 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 come back to a, to a question which was posed in the in the QR as I seen if we ask for mental health, uh, and the answer is no. We did not ask for mental health, but we asked for um, self-assessed health in general. And there we find that uh, well, about one in four had some had some health problems and and issues. So so there is a substantial number of people um, reporting some some kind of of health problems of limitation or, or uh, limitations in activities uh, of daily. Um, Living whether well, these are due to mental uh, health or, or 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 not, so this we are not able to to say. Conrad, would you like to add something? Yeah, um, well, there, there are um, there are some important issues concerning the uh, the intention uh, by Dan uh, Idukovic, uh, which I find very interesting um about the the role of diaspora in the intention uh, of return um, i would say that the diaspora has played an important role in um, the the choice possible choice of uh, the destination although here poland was um, as we could see in the case of our um of our um in our sample, they say that this was, uh, as, as uh, Isabella was showing, was sort of by accident in a way. It was first country place, a safe place to 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 move out, in a way. Uh, so I would say that the diaspora was in a way important in that. But, but I'm not so sure that it is important to um, to stay uh, in in the country. I would say more. The, uh, the 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 issues of um, of general mechanisms of, of reception are, are more important than the the, the but obviously if diaspora was stronger uh, as well be more sort of uh, deeply rooted with more uh, institutions with better better organized even um, then it could play some role but uh, but not in as as it is the the diaspora. You need to know that, that this is pretty new diaspora. Poland turned from being mostly emigration country to immigration country only uh, uh, in the last years, like from 2014 onwards. In a way, invasion uh, of the, the beginning of, of of the war in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea and the, and the war in Donbass was the was also important uh, element in 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 this shift of of the Polish uh, uh, Ukrainian migration to to Poland and there was also a question about the recognition of um, of qualifications this is important um, obviously it plays a role but I would say uh, there's also a question somewhere among those uh, in the q a about the language uh, here I would say more is the is the the uh, recognition of qualifications is one thing which is important and you can see in the case of Poland that uh, for example there is uh, important opening in the, um, in the medical, uh, system where, where as as a result of pandemic, there is more um, 
liberty uh, of employing even persons who are not, who's rec who, who do not have their qualifications fully recognized. So this is something which was sustained in the case of Poland. It allows persons uh, from the medical sphere to enter Polish medical sphere. But I would say uh, what is very important is the 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 proximity, some uh, some um, um, links between Polish and Ukrainian language, as both are um, with Slavic languages. So it is in a way easier, even for persons who do not know Polish at all, to 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 perform some simple task, you know, even without any knowledge of the language. So I think this is something. Um, important for for the labor markets uh, more than than even the the recognition of qualifications, which is also a super important thing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, unfortunately, we are already uh, at the end of our time. Um, a lot of questions are still answered by our colleagues here uh, on the floor. We will keep the webinar a short while open so that you still can uh, communicate. Uh, but this is now the point in time to. To thank you all uh, uh, for joining this webinar, in particular to our three speakers for these really exciting insights into the research. You can see from the debate we had and from the audience we had that this is really a very hot issue and this is really a very exciting uh, uh, issue to discuss. And so thanks a lot uh, for giving us these insights. And I'm sure there will be some follow up and we will try to follow up also your research on these important topics. So thanks a lot. And now I uh, uh, keep the floor a little bit open so that you still can uh, answer and uh, put questions to the speakers. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for coming and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.